building products for customers and I like building teams. And mm -hmm. I think venture investing is exciting and a lot of, you know, friends do it and, you know, invest on the side a little bit, but it's not as team, you know, as team focused and it's not as like customer focused and a lot of your destiny is out of your control and you invest in the CEO and you just like, hope this thing works. So when building a company, like you have a lot more control over your destiny. And so I think that that part is, is interesting to me as well. Yeah. What's up everybody. Your life alchemist, your dragon. Welcome to alchemized life. I'm your host, Justin David Carl. This is a show where I seek out and share expertise, wisdom, and thought leadership in all domains with the mission of empowering and inspiring you to proactively design and truly live a life worth living. We're all in this together. And when we do the work together, we go so much farther, so much faster, and have so much more fun. Without further ado, let's dig into this episode and alchemize life. Ramji, my brother from Stanford, so good to have you on the show. ABC, what's going on, man? To kick things off, let's talk about your uh, brief endeavors in smuggling. <laughs> <laughs> so this was sophomore year at Stanford, and four of us went down to Tijuana across the U.S.-Mexico border. And one of the people in our party was a European citizen and had forgotten his passport. I won't leave the country, but anyway... After a long night in Tijuana, Rosarito, you know, we decided to go back across, drive back across the border to, to San Diego. And all of us, except this one guy, had our IDs, in, in this case, either, you know, passports or, or what have you. This guy actually had to catch a flight to Europe that day itself. And so, you know, timing impeccable. We drive up to the border they look at all of us, look for our IDs, look at this guy, just keep it moving, and then boom, he's across the border. So, made it with, you know, hours to spare. This guy was sweating bullets before it happened, but yeah, so that's how we got across the border. Oh, the ridiculous things we attempt to do in uh, college. Such a good time. Wow. Well, well uh, to introduce you to the audience, um, you are the CEO and co-founder of Takeo Bio, obviously uh, by the name of Biotech Company. You're also the previous, uh, I think, 11-year CEO of Council, another uh, uh, biotech company. You went to Stanford University. You have a degree there in uh, computer science as well as another degree from there, right? Yeah, a master's in financial math. Yeah. And then I got that, the, the, the dubious distinction of being able to drop out of two programs simultaneously, the MBA program, which, and the biomedical informatics program. So I started the MS program there, the MBA, but then peaced out after the first year. So, so tell us about like, how did you decide to actually drop out and, and pursue? Oh, you did it. So I'm telling you, well, so long story short, by applying to Stanford you know, I was working in Wall Street. I was really unhappy for a variety of reasons, but I was like, these guys are just like moving around pieces of paper there and changing the world. So I wanted to come back to Stanford. And in end of 2005, I read Paul Graham's book. So there's like hackers and painters. Yeah. And there was one part about that, about starting startups. And that I was just absolutely hooked. I was mesmerized. And there's also this thing about like nerds are unpopular and stuff like that. I'm like, well, that, that chapter doesn't resonate with me, but you know, the, the rest of it was, was incredible. And so, but then, you know, and I had just finished my application to MBA, but then he took a bunch of shots at MBAs in the book. Yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck, did I just apply to like, did I just make a mistake by, you know, applying to Stanford MBA? Are we dumb? So I bought into this ideology, which obviously is totally wrong that we're, we're, uh, you know, uh, GSP is incredible and we have so many amazing people. 
But so I bought into this ide ideology that was like, oh, we're just paper pushers and so on and so forth. So I came into Stanford thinking it would be cool to leave as opposed to for a variety of other reasons. And when I got back to GSB, sometimes like the classes, they were, you know, very rule. You had to follow a bunch of rules, like show up all the time. Whereas in engineering, you could just like kind of float in or out. You weren't you were required to. So they, they felt like they treated us a little bit like kids sometimes. Eh. And, you know, so by the end of that, I was like, oh, I'm going to engineer this, this dropout story. So uh, I totally, I've got one of my employees who went back to GSB and I told them to stay, have fun. It's like incredible. So for listeners, stay if you're, if you're going to be GSB. So. so essentially you, you, you decided to like drop out or that you were going to engineer your dropout. Like, did you know? that the potential for you to work, you know, be a part of this uh, company council uh, was like an opportunity, like as you were starting the program or, or how did that actually happen? No, as I was applying, I was thinking, I'm going to start a company and I was thinking mobile internet. And so this is like 2005, 2006, I was thinking I want to do something in mobile internet, but I just didn't know what. So mm -hmm. I was totally open to different idea spaces and you know as i got there my brother and another co-founder pitched me on this idea of genomics and i know knew about as much as genomics as i know today about solar energy which is that the sun powers <laughs> something so we got together then started council so i decided to be broken live on a futon for a bunch of years that's great so what ultimately like you know gave you the confidence to like drop that program and go after this like startup you know kind of ceo blind stupidity uh, oh okay <laughs> yeah i mean so we really in, in retrospect blind stupidity and also the idea that rather uh, what what the actual legit thing is since i was in wall street i you know i chased prestige i got into stanford undergrad then i got to morgan stanley which is very prestigious and then i got back into stanford which is like prestige so I worried that if I stuck around in second year, I would get trapped into the consulting or investment banking rat race. And, you know, and I, would, I just worried that I would just get trapped and then go back into to Wall Street. And so I, and that was actually the real, one of the other real reasons is like, if I leave, I'll make a conscious decision that I don't get trapped back into this because I felt like 15 years could elapse and then I would just be ending up as... In, in Wall Street and not not happy or not doing what I wanted to do. Does that make sense in terms of like, there were like two motivations that that second motivation was probably as powerful as the first? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I kind of fell into the same trap. I, uh, I tried to convince myself that I could do investment banking because I too was chasing like prestige. So, you know, I worked at uh, an internship at D WR Hambrecht in San Francisco, like which was a boutique firm at the the uh, back then. Yeah, and then I worked at Morgan Stanley and Prime Brokerage uh, in New York in an internship, and I was literally trying to convince myself that like this, you know, as a successful Stanford student, this is like what I should be doing. I can earn lots of money, you know, have lots of prestige, but it just was not for me so i totally understand yeah. uh the whole like chasing the prestige thing too you know stanford for me was a, a childhood dream my father went to the gsb stanford business school and i just always wanted to go there and always really wanted to be an entrepreneur but then i kind of got like caught up in the whole like consulting and and banking like investment banking yes. like I don't know. It's just like, you know, because I was a, uh, you know, class of 06. And like, I, I feel like at that time, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on kind of like going and being a part of a startup. And there was like a huge yeah. emphasis on consulting and investment banking for some reason. Yeah. Did you feel like that was the same for you? Totally. Because in... And I think that I, the reasons why are well, COVID also changes a lot of this, but it's like in 02, 01, there was a dot com crash. And so I was graduating mm. in 03. And so there was like the internet is dead, e commerce is over. It's all like a scam, blah, blah, blah. Of course, Google will, and PayPal and all these things, all these amazing companies emerged, you know, during that time. But 
it was just commonly accepted wisdom and it's like okay that entire chapter was fake let's move on let's get back to like wall street and old stable businesses and, and so on and so forth so absolutely and it was i think actually there's like a lot of parallels to today which is like now a lot of those bright people are going into Uber or Google, or Airbnb or, you know, Genentech. And that's awesome. As opposed to just being part of the consulting and banking class. You know, I think there's just like, it's in COVID obviously made more people interested in like digital health or medicine and stuff like that. So I think that that's flipping some of this, which is, is kind of incentive driven, right? So it was like, as young people, it's like, it's going to be financially stable and also, you know, do something that's interesting and the worst advice i ever got in undergrad was this guy who worked at goldman for a while he's like lucrative or interesting pick one and i'm like that sounds really depressing <laughs> but that was it it was like so we're like okay i guess you could do like interesting math or computer science or you got to be like a borg uh i don't know if this but but obviously startups are a way to do both not that finances are the every, everything, but it's like, it's nice to be financially awarded and also do something interesting. So that's a, a false trade off in, in my book. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, like that's so black and white because there's lots of ways to do interesting things and for it to be lucrative if you're kind of like strategic about your decision, right? Yeah. You know, I would, yeah. like in my view, there's millions of ways to make a lot of money. And ultimately that's what I told myself when I was at Morgan Stanley, I was like, why am I doing this? Like, like, and, and like, yeah. you know, everyone there was super driven and smart, but like, I looked at the lifestyle yeah. that they lived and, you know, I it's... was, and the actual work that like I would be doing for the first, you know, three to seven plus years. And I was like, this is going to like kill my soul. And well, that's exactly what you asked about. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. So, that, I mean, in August 2004, I was working on the Google IPO and like I was, it was like 116 hours in a week. I was working 140, like sleeping one or two hours a week. And it was August 2004. The city was lit. Everybody was out going, having fun. I'm sleeping under a desk. And I'm like, the founders of Google remind me of my computer science TAs. And like they're changing the world and I'm moving around pieces of paper. Like, what the fuck am I doing with them? Like, I got to get, get out of here. Yeah. So that was like a very important moment. And then I was like, if I c continue down this path, it's like uninteresting work. And then people are doing real stuff. And, you know, that's fun and important and like makes a difference. So I think that really flipped a switch for me. Hey there. Just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode. And then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Veg Nutrition, Live Better. So I'm actually a veg elite athlete. And before I joined the team, I spent months doing my due diligence to make sure that the company was vision, mission, and value aligned with me, my values, my mission, my vision, and my lifestyle. I got to know the owners super well. I even got to know the person who formulates all the products and they passed with flying colors. So I couldn't be more excited to represent a company that I feel so aligned with. And I want to tell you about two of my favorite products. The first is the veg pre-workout. So when I first went vegan or mostly vegan, the last thing for me to go fully vegan was finding a vegan pre-workout that gave me the focus, the energy, and the power that I was looking for. And I can tell you, this is the best pre-workout that I've ever had. It gives me incredible focus and energy. And what's probably the best is it leaves me with no crash after I take it, which is great. And the flavors are so freaking good. There's literally peach mango, and a Patriot Pop that tastes like, you know, the firecracker popsicles, cherry lemon lime flavor. They're literally so good that I can dry scoop them. And 
they just released a watermelon flavor for just in time for summer and it's incredible so that's the first product the second product is arguably also my favorite and that's the plant protein comes in three incredible flavors chocolate peanut butter vanilla ice cream and cold brew coffee yep you heard me cold brew coffee flavor it tastes incredible all three flavors 25 grams of protein fully organic incredible ingredients heavy metal tested and it is my go-to post-workout make sure that i'm recovering and refueling and giving my muscles the protein that they need to rebuild for that next workout so go to vegnutrition.com slash dragon and try their full line of supplements and you'll get 15 percent off or you can just use dragon at checkout and you'll get 15 percent off so that's vegnutrition.com slash dragon to get 15 percent off veg nutrition live better yeah a similar thing happened to me so I looked around at everybody that, you know, at Morgan Stanley, that was like, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ahead of me. And I asked myself, like, do I want their life? And like the clear yeah. answer was absolutely not. Like they were like, you know, balding and completely out of shape and stressed out and Good like working body. insane hours. And I was like, I don't want to like sacrifice like my health and well being to like chase money when there's like a million ways to make money. So ultimately, you know, I went back to Stanford to kind of like figure things out. Yeah. And then similar to you, <laughs> I ended up dropping yeah. out as well. I got to see my life. Uh, oh, you did? Yeah. You dropped out, I, you said? Yeah, I did. So oh. I, because I had stopped out, I actually stopped out to work at W. Hambrecht like for like, like, more full time uh, during the school year because I was just like, I don't know what I want to do after school. So like, I'm gonna like, and I was kind of getting bored of like the yeah. the classwork grind. And I was like, okay, I'll go work for like six months. So like, I stopped out um, for a quarter. Then I think it was a quarter, and maybe it's two quarters. But anyways, when I uh, finished up at Morgan Stanley, I had two quarters left to finish, and then I went back to Stanford. And fate would have it that my, you know, then girlfriend got a job offer to go work at a, uh, like basically be the general manager of the flagship bar in West Hollywood for Randy Gerber, which like he's behind like, uh, like all the bars and the W hotels. Wow. And, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And she was like, should I take it? And I was like, heck Yeah. And I'll meet you there because I don't know what I want to do after Stanford. So I'll just stop out again, which, you know, yeah. it's like I, I asked them if it was OK. And they're like, yeah, it's fine. And I was planning to come back in a year. But, you know, then that turned into eight years. So <laughs> you still get hit up for a donation, though, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is I used to be one of those people who would call uh, the alumni. Yeah and yeah. tried try to get alumni to donate money and then i ended ended up managing that call center as as That's one so of the, also yeah so it's it's pretty funny but uh so i'm curious do you think On there's more simple, i had one uh, one uh my bps i learned so much from him he was an amazing mentor he was awesome and you know still staying to us to this day so yeah, but you're right. It is it is hard, hard work. So um, I learned a lot in terms of like how to deliver stuff on time, like also, but uh, it's just in terms of domain and energy. I, I feel like I want to do something different, but yeah, sorry. You were saying? Yeah, no, I'm just, I wanted to touch back on a little bit, just the, the kind of like this uh, back, you know, kind of in the 05 time frame, like when, and when there was just kind of like a lot of, I don't know, Stanford societal pressure to go work at like a safe, prestigious job. Yeah. Like, and, you know, with COVID and like everything that's happened, you know, recently, do you think like, 
is there more encouragement for like you know recent graduate students to go like take a risk and 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 work at you know a newer startup or like is it like oh just go work for like a safe company like google or like one of the big tech companies like what is your do you have any insider thoughts around that yeah i mean you know one of our early employees went to b school and i think there are a lot of people are taking looking at startups and one is it's just been becoming de risk over the last 15 20 years right it, of course it's extremely risky don't get me wrong but like the tools, all that stuff is advanced. It's so much easier to build a company in 2022 than it is in 2002. Right? Hey. You've got like Gusto and payroll and all this stuff. It's like all it, like HubSpot, all these things you could just link up very quickly that didn't even exist. So, you know, you can reduce down to market risk and people risk as opposed to all this internal tooling risk, which existed before. So it's like your speed to market is faster, your cost is, is lower, so you can try out ideas at a, a lot faster rate. So I think in terms of risk profile, people are more like, it just lowered the cost of entry. And so that allows people to take on some risk. And also if you're 22 and you know spending a year or two trying with something that's very different than if you're 42, you know, in terms of like, you may not have work in it, your kids, et cetera, at, the, at that time. So, but you know, kids who take a job at Google and, and so on is, I think is actually still good because it's not going into, well, like, I, I feel like at least in tech, they're producing products that people will like and use. Like, I don't feel like if you're going to consulting, it's like you're changing the McDonald's stripe through, throughput, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> I, I feel like if you're at Uber, like you're, you're actually changing something that's like, okay improve London traffic by 30%. It's like, that's interesting, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think I just, uh, I'm such a, like, I, I'm a huge fan of Google personally, uh, just because I think they've really, uh, they played a major part in really redefining the employee experience in the sense of, like, you yeah. know, having, like, you know, basically taking such good care of their their people, you know, with the food and the snacks and the campus and the activities and just like uh, the entire experience of what it means to be like a uh, part of that company is like night and day between that yeah, and you, say like a bank. <laughs> what's, that's true in terms of how they treat their people, I think is great. But I, I do feel like as one of my old co-founders said, it's like a lot of startups trying to copy Google's perks, but not its cash flow. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like as a small startup, there's no way to compete with Google on all the perks that they have, like you know, a bowling alley, multiple gyms, of like you know, a strength trainer's dream. It's like nap pods, etc. Like instead, like if you're trying to win employees to to come work with you. It's much more about like the team environment, like the problem they're working on, and they'll you know, be able to make an impact on a smaller team. It's not going to be on on you know competing perk for perk because they'll win that every time. So, yeah. So I'm curious, like if you were to go back, let's say you were like you know in your early 20s again, and you know you had this option of going to like a company like Google or Uber or like you know one of these like these larger tech companies or like going and being a part of you know an infinitely smaller startup that like may or may not make it like we like what would you do now kind of like kind of knowing your previous experience would you do the same exact thing over or or if you don't want to think through it that way like what would you encourage like a recent graduate to do to kind of like maximize both their like short and long-term success and their overall kind of like happiness in life well the overall happiness in life one is that comes from like that cannot be pursued it ensues you know shout out victor frankel you know man search for meaning so like it's it's hard to for happiness to just like be pursued it is it is a result of like satisfying work relationships family all this, this stuff but going back to your first question which is like to be honest with you, if I were just on undergrad or 
the master's program, I would still probably take the Google job because it still was in the prestige cheese save mindset. So like versus a smaller startup. Yeah. So that that's that's me. Like to be to honest, like at that time I needed to have that to not have it, if that makes sense. Totally. So to go through that experience. It... Yeah. I was literally yeah. the same with banking. Like I had to do banking to like know for a fact it was not for me, even though yeah. intu intuitively yeah. I knew it wasn't for me, but my yeah. ego, my ego was like, no, like you can make a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. Like it's very prestigious. Like, you know, if you get it, it means you're a success, go do it. And then I did it. And I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. It's like that Harold Kumar thing, right? So where he like tries to tell the kids not to do banking and they all do. So, you know, yeah. So, you know, for, for the new grads, though, like if they're going to pick a startup, I think the the founding team matters a lot. Like ideally, yeah. because like there's all these studies about your boss influences your mental health and, and so on and so forth. So ideally, you can see if this person has been like a product manager at a place like Google, Airbnb, and something like that, a place where you like the products. Or mm -hmm. they've got a track record of doing it before, or they've delivered something on time and under budget. Mm -hmm. And you could also check references about them. Because if you're going to bet on a smaller company, you know, there's no need to do it blind. You could there's actually like a science a little bit of a science to it. Obviously, you know, working at a small startup, you'll be incredibly useful to a larger company if for whatever reason you decide to leave after a couple of years or the startup doesn't work out. But yeah, I think you can vet the CEO and the founding team a lot more with the tools we have today and like do quick checks and say like, am I going to enjoy working with this person or is it going to be miserable? You know? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode and then we'll dig right back in. This show is brought to you by Feel Free from Botanic tonics. This product is unlike anything I've ever had before. No joke. It's made with kava root and other ancient plants and just half a shot gives me this incredible sense of focused flow and productivity. And I love to take just half a shot right before I work out. I take it with my pre-workout and it takes my workouts to the next level. It is seriously unlike anything I've ever had. It's also an incredible productivity tool for any big work projects that you have or long periods of time where you just need to be super focused in flow state and get a lot of shit done. So if you want to give this a shot, you can go to botanictonics.com and use code DRAGON at checkout to get 40% off your first order. No joke. 40% off with code DRAGON. That's feel free from botanictonics.com, code DRAGON. Feel free, feel good. Yeah, no, I think that's incredibly important because we all spend a third of our life at work, right? And if we're going to go start something, yeah. like we better freaking love the people that we work with, right? Because, you know, the chances yeah. of uh, A, it being like successful depending on kind of the team you assemble and the, you know, uh, business endeavor you're going after, you know, could be really good or could be really low. But the one thing yeah. that is for sure is you will be putting a massive amount of time and energy into it with these other people. So yes. even if it's going to fail, you may as well be like spending a lot of time and energy with people that like you would love to spend time and energy with. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Life, life is truly too short to like, I dealt with the other side of draining energy. It's like exhausting. And I don't know if you've ever read Godman's work on contempt and like marriage and relationships. It's, it's fascinating, but in short, like being treated with contempt lowers people's immune system and increases their susceptibility to, you know, cold virus and so on and so forth. So if somebody's in an environment like that and you can't fire that person, then it's it's probably time oh, to, to move on. That's a good point. Yeah, if they're a part of the founding team, it's kind of hard to fire them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. 
Yeah, I'm familiar with Gottman's work um, just because, you know, I'm a lifelong student and studying his work on like, you know, success in marriage has been really awesome for me. I've been wanting to do one of his programs, um, actually, so I can like make sure that me and my wife are, you know, as uh, advanced in, uh, you know, living our best marriage life as possible, but haven't got to that yet. A lot of the, Not... a lot of the techniques apply to work, too. Oh, interesting. That's true. It's you kind of are marrying whoever you get into business with in not, a certain not, sense. But it's like the nature of human relations, right? So it's like appreciation, uh, you know, and he describes as like negative patterns and like how to break out the negative patterns too. Like, so it's, it's surprisingly useful, not just at home, but at work as well. Yeah. So I'm curious, you mentioned kind of the, the, uh, top of the show that like, you know, in regards to your uh, knowledge around uh, like genetics and all that stuff, like very little to none uh, about as much as you uh, understand solar power. Do you think like CEOs need to have like deep domain expertise in order to like, uh, you know, be a, a founder and CEO of a company or what are your thoughts around, you know, how much expertise is needed or if you don't have it, like, how do you, you know, make sure that gap is filled? That's a good question. To answer your question, you probably need some domain expertise. And the in this case, Eric, my co-founder, trained me in genetics. He taught me how to pipette. I, I went to the lab and, I mean, eventually kicked me out. He's like, actually, go do work instead of, you know, bothering me here at the lab. But I learned a lot of the basics of lab processing and then in terms of computational analysis i tried my hand at that as well so i, I like i could understand the basics but we got that allowed me to to help you know build a team that had experts in those different domains so the ceo really needs to be an expert in understanding the customer need mm. you know and that that is the the hard part because the customer need is going to change and market need is going to change but absolutely, like being a world class, you know, expert in solar is useful if you, you know, if your technology is like building solar, but it's like you have to understand like residential installations or like what is the price that somebody is willing to pay or like what is the value prop to, to a customer and then back solve that. I mean, the common mistake and is to start with the technology and back solve the problem. And he, Steve Jobs said this as well, which is like, it's like you, which is backwards. It's like you want to start with the customer need and then back sell the technology, right? Like, let's say I talk about automated laundry folding. Like, I'm not an expert in laundry folding, but robotics and stuff like that are the tools you need to do that. Do I need to be an expert in robotics to do, build that company? Probably not. Uh, you know, you can get people with robotics expertise, but the, the part that the CEO can fail at is hiring that person with robotics expertise if they don't try it themselves for a little bit. So yeah. like the general thing is to try function and like know what works and doesn't work. And then if you can hire advisors to like, to help you interview those people, that's also like one way if you don't have the domain expertise yourself. Eh. So I'm curious, you know, you had a successful exit from uh council. Why did you decide to like go on and, and start another company? Yeah, again, the stupidity, like selective amnesia in this case, but <laughs> like, oh yeah, what could go wrong with starting another company? But a couple things. What well, like one is, you know, council we had five hundred soldiers, it was amazing, we had a great team and a lot of alumni have done gone on to do great successful stuff. And, you know, ultimately when it came down to it, I really like building products for customers and I like building teams. And mm -hmm. I think venture investing is exciting and a lot of, you know, friends do it and you know invest on the side a little bit but it's not as team you know as team focused and it's not as like customer focused and a lot of your destiny is out of your control you invest in the ceo and you just like hope this thing works so when building a company like you have a lot more control over your destiny and so i think that that part is is interesting to me as well so yeah and yeah so that, I mean, that was, that was why it was a long process to get back here. Yeah. So how much time in between the successful exit from council before you ended up 
you know, co-founding uh, Takeo Bio? So it was about a year. So, you know, in the beginning, I just want to do like random fun stuff. So like I went to China, learned a little bit of Chinese in Kunming, you know, went to like learn to MMA and, you know, did all it's like crazy, like kickboxing against these Chinese people who are just super strong, even though like fat people can hit hard, which was <laughs> like surprising. And like one guy, he didn't have any nerve endings in his shin because he just hit it against the, uh, like that's what these Muay Thai guys do, the guys do. They just hit it against the wall over and over again. And I'm like, okay, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not at this <laughs> level. So after catching a few beatings, uh, that was one of the like things I want to do. Then I, you know, got to a little bit of winter sports. So, you know, learned how to snowboard and stuff like that. And I've been looking at a couple of ideas, you know, men's nutrition, we talked about Uber for blood draw and cause that'd been a big issue for us at council and all, all of our peers. <laughs> and one idea in minimal resi residual disease detection and which is like cancer detection, which is also interesting on. Um, and I've been coming close to an acquisition on a blood draw startup before COVID happened. And like, it just became very difficult to like price anything because where people going into the draw station or whatever. Eh. And well, I realized that this like, you know, COVID thing was like a, a serious, you know, issue. And, you know, it offended all my sense of like civil liberties uh, of all the restrictions. Like I, you know, believe in all the vaccines and, and so forth, but I was worried about like the course of nature of it. So I thought, you know, testing is one way to, to help people get, you know, back to work. They can test and, and, and feel, feel better. And then the immunity. So testing, you know, I was, I was part of a, a, a company at, at the board level uh, called Vault Health that uh, did a lot of COVID testing for a little bit. But then immunity, I didn't, I knew a little bit about. My dad's an infectious disease doc and, you know, at the council, we had looked at some ideal ideas in immunology. But I contacted my now co-founder, Matt Spitzer. He had won an award on Fast Grants, with the, which the Stripe Brothers found, funded at the beginning of COVID to accelerate scientific research. So rapid grants and... He had won an award for characterizing immune response to cancer vaccines that can be applied to COVID. And when they say characterizing, it means like finding distinguishing features, like what's different about Justin's immune system that makes him have a successful, you know, response to a vaccine. And that was really interesting, which is like, you can look at your blood to determine whether this, this vaccine is going to be successful. So we got to chatting and then. Matt is such a humble guy, great scientist, you know, already a tenured prof, despite, you know, uh, being super, you know, early in his career. And I said, this man is a very humble guy. Like we could do something together, which is like build a, a blood based immune profiling company. So we can, we can do something together, build a company where we profile the immune system from blood and figure out who's likely to respond to different drugs for cancer, for autoimmune, for infectious disease, any, any disease where the drug hits drugs it's the immune system and uh yeah as we got to chatting we decided to we worked together informally for a few months and then booted out the company in september 2020 so yeah and we're 14 people now and work with a bunch of great drug companies a lot of expert phds and immunology I'm one of the few non-phds of the company but yeah here we are awesome so i'm curious you know you you spent 11 years at council being ceo there what are some of the you know top kind of like lessons around leadership that you have brought to your newest endeavor or that you would think anyone in a leadership position uh, within a, a company should learn and implement in their own leadership role? That's a really good question. I mean, one of them is around leading from the front, which is like I never ask people to do anything that I personally wouldn't do and same goes for my co-founder as well. So it's like doing things like writing a bunch of emails each day, uh, like, or doing quote unquote lower level work, et cetera. It's like, so I think that's very important for me personally. I, I like keeping an ear to the ground and to listen yeah. to a bunch of customers. So if the leader of the organization is listening to co customers, chances are people inside the company are, are listening to customers. The second is around like making use of your team and like allowing, you know, asking your team to come up with plans as opposed to trying to impose plans on them. That's just, that always backfires. 
Mm -hmm. So if your team draws up a plan and the timeline and so on and so forth, they'll be far more invested than it, then it won't be Justin's plan. It'll be the team's plan. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, people get much more excited about those kind of things. So, and the third thing is around pricing, which is, it's a common mistake to price too low. We did it at uh council and it, it was very difficult to go back up afterwards. Mm. So pricing commensurate with your value, which it's usually like time saved or headcount or dollar saved or throughput saved, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's also, you know, an important, you know, those are three things. So one is leading for the front. The second is like making use of your team. And then as opposed to trying to do everything yourself. And then the third is uh, around pricing. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Fit Rich Vegan. If you're ready to get in the best shape of your life, double your income, and 10x your savings and investments, then this is the coaching program for you. But wait a minute, Dragon. Isn't this your coaching program? Heck yeah, it is. I spent the last eight years mastering my fitness and my finances, and I've built an incredible coaching program with an incredible team to help you get the body of your dreams and finally achieve that level of financial success that you've been seeking. So if you want to find out if you're a good fit for the program, go to fitrichvegan.com and book your free consultation today. Or you can just DM me on Instagram with the words Fit Rich Vegan, and we can chat about if it's going to be a good fit for you. I'm committed to empowering people to actually achieve their fitness and financial goals. I spent the last 20 years trying to figure this out on my own. And what I realized is the key to doing it is not doing it alone. You have to have coaches, you have to have mentors, and you have to be a part of masterminds. And that's exactly what Fit Rich Vegan has. It has coaches, mentors, and it is a mastermind. So again, if you're ready to book your free consultation today, go to fitrichvegan.com or drop me a DM on Instagram. Yeah. No, I think that's so true about all, all, all of those, right? Like, no one's going to respect a leader that isn't willing to like roll out their sleeves and like do the work that they have to do. And it is, I think it's human nature to hate to be told what to do. <laughs> Whereas if you have a, like a stake in like what you're going to be doing, like if you're a part of the planning of what you're going to be doing, you're like so much yeah. more mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually invested in actually like taking that action and then, you know, the pricing, I think, you know, I don't know if it's a fundamental like flaw where we undervalue ourselves. So we undervalue the value of the product That's or it. service that we're, we're bringing, but like, yeah, it's, I couldn't agree more with all of those. Before we hit record, you mentioned that like you were really interested in medical incentives right now. Can you speak a little bit more about why and what you mean by that? Yeah. You know, one thing I have been thinking about is like when I was growing up, my dad said, whatever you do, you, both of my parents are physicians. It's like, whatever you do, don't become a doctor. And <laughs> shit, of, of course, I started a company that ends up dealing with a bunch of insurance and so on because he was, he was fatigued with fighting insurers with the uh, HMOs in the 1990s. And uh, I think about like, you've got a million docs in the US and Many of them are unhappy in their work. And they imagine if like for, you know how salespeople just hate writing notes in Salesforce or HubSpot as if it's like, you know, like they're being a, a, like a medieval rack or torture. Oh, I'm moving. Yep. It's so like, yeah. So imagine like for blocks, we're asking these neurosurgeons all this to waste so much time entering notes into computer. They're like, I'm not a fucking robot. It's like I signed up to medicine to see patients. Uh, so like part of this is, and people like to blame insurers, but that's not the root cause. The insurers are served by their customers are employers. So, you know, the enemy, so to speak, is ourselves, right? Like, if you think about that, I don't, and I, don't, I think the enemy thing is like too black and white, which is 
part of the reason that we're here today is you randomly get insurance through your employer. Like we don't pay for anybody's rent. We don't pay for anybody's food. We, we give them a salary and hopefully they can figure out what makes sense for them. So if you can decouple a couple things, one is if you can decouple health insurance from the employer and just have it tax free, that would be good. But the second thing is for doctors, if doctors charge like lawyers, I think they'd be a lot happier. So, and people would want to enter the medical profession, you know, if we call up any lawyer that pays by hour, we talk about like UFC, they'll talk about UFC because <laughs> they're billing $700 or $800 by the hour. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, whereas for physicians, this isn't a slur, but like, if you look at LinkedIn, your doctor is very likely not going to be on LinkedIn. And do you know why that is? Yeah. <laughs> It's because they're not getting compensated to talk to customers. Whereas if you look at any partner in a law firm, pick a, you know, Cooley, whatever, like they will list their email, phone number, and so, and so on and so forth. So like, why is that? It's not like that the Cooley person is dumb and not the doctor is smart. They're, they're both very bright people, obviously, right? Uh -huh. But like the incentives have made it hard to get access to the doctor. So then when you see the doctor, you're like, you, you feel rushed and all this stuff happens. And this all ties back to incentive. Not that like, again, not that money is the reason the extra or whatever, but if you make people, people feel undervalued or uncompensated for the work, you know, they may adopt these kind of behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So if you give doctors more incentives or you unlock more me medical incentives, I think that'll be really successful for them. And people will feel happier about being in medicine. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one big thing about medical incentive, which is like the simple thing is a couple in like how to, how to do startups as like, as opposed to legislative fixes, because if you're waiting for some lawyer or some congressman to willing to fix it, it's just going to take too long. So if you could decouple in insurance, I think that'd be interesting. Two is like, some startup that pays docs on a cash basis as opposed to insurance basis, they would love that because then they don't have to do 40% of their time wasted. And then the, you know, kind of third one is around malpractice. Have you heard of Metro Mal? Yes. So that like pr prices based on your actual risk as a driver, if you're, you know, doing donuts, it'll pr price accordingly, right? So for docs, their malpractice is like one size fits all. And it's like, Imagine starting a like donut store and you have a hundred eight thousand dollar malpractice premium you have to pay each year. Mm -hmm. So that's the price of these premiums. So if these are the kind of like startups to be built in areas like this, which I think will make people a lot happier in medicine. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I think these are like some really great ideas and potential like actual insight for any. Uh, future enterprising entrepreneurs. So I know we're getting close to time, but I just wanted, you know, as somebody who's essentially been an entrepreneur since, you know, 2005-ish now, like what kind of, uh, you know, parting advice or words of wisdom would you share with someone who's either, you know, thinking they want to get into entrepreneurship or even asking for advice of like, how do I actually get started? Or like, what are the things that I should be like studying or doing if I, you know, want to like get out of this corporate job and like go do, you know, my own thing or join a, like a early stage startup? Yeah. I mean, I would, for the second one, in terms of advice, I would read Y Combinator's stuff. They have incredible things about why to start a startup, how to start a startup. They've written extensively about this, and I think that's awesome. The second part is about, in response to the third question, about leaving a job. It's really about managing fear and like thinking about if you fast forward 20 years in this, is that okay? Are you okay with that outcome? If so, that's fine. But some people are not, and they want to take on that risk. So thinking through like, what is your downside as far as fear goes? And in certain cases, it could be very real financial downside. So that, that does matter. And then in terms of like parting advice, I think really about, you know, the paying customer is truth. 
right? And markets and science are two of the hardest disciplines because science is like discovering what has not been discovered before and markets in some ways and like building companies are also discovering what people have not paid for before. Hmm. And the reason paying customer is true, and especially the repeat paying customer is the old, you know, Abraham Lincoln saying of, you know, you can fool some of the people all the time, but you can't fool, you know, shout out George Bush, <laughs> all of the people all the time, right? So like the, the idea that somebody, when they part with their money is very, turns very serious. Like you can have a bunch of discussions about startups and then, or about your product. And then you ask somebody for money and then you will see their real reaction real quick. Yeah. You know what I mean? They'll be like, talk, talk, talk. Be like, oh yeah, that sounds a great idea. Okay. Would you pay $10? Look, like, ah, uh, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, that's very like, true. To... Yeah. I just want comment on so that because getting... I think that's so genius is, is if you have a entrepreneurial idea, like I, I think you could totally bet beta test it on your friends because your friends are going to be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. That's absolutely genius. And then like the way to beta test is be like, great, uh, it's a hundred bucks. How many would you like? And see, you know, if they would yeah. actually purchase yeah. it uh, from you. And if they don't, yeah. then be like, okay, like, you know, there's not really a product market fit yet or, or, or a, a need or a demand or, you know, an acceptance of value for that product or service. But I'm sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. You're about to say something. You summarize it really well. I think the, the, you know, the other advice is, you know, people talk about like, oh, you know, you have, you have, you have to nail everything on the, on the first try and, you know, but that's, that's not true. It's like, there's, there's an iterative process and there's a learning process to startups. So it's very hard to get everything right in the beginning. I remember when the Netflix culture deck came out, I'm like, oh my God, these guys have everything figured out. But it came out in 2008 and Netflix went through near death in 2001, in 2000, mm. after 9-11 and they laid off like 40% of the company and all this stuff. So to me, it had emerged fully formed from the head of Athena. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like the deck just existed and they had always had everything right. But it actually emerged through great chaos and pain. You know what I mean? So yeah. like having a little bit of patience that these lessons emerge over time as opposed to all can be predicted. You know, I think that's also important. Yeah. Well, Ranji, so good to connect with you. I know you gotta jump into another meeting. Where's the if yeah. people do want to connect with you online, where's the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah, either LinkedIn or Twitter. Okay. Great. And then I'll put your links uh, in the show notes. And then any last words of wisdom or requests to be made to the audience or any other thoughts uh, before we shut this down? No, brother. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you. Awesome, brother. Thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, literally everything can be used as an opportunity to learn, to heal, to grow, and to transform. So whatever is going on in your life, choose to consciously and proactively harness that energy and use it to alchemize your life to the next level. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or on your favorite social media and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. As always, you can find me at Justin David Carl on Instagram and all the socials, as well as at alchemizelife.com on the web. Until the next time, sending you lots of energy and plenty of dragon magic. <laughs>